In 1927, Liberia incumbent Charles D.B. King of the True Whig Party was running for a third presidential term against Thomas J. Falconer of the People's Party. King was a well-established political figure who had previously served as the country's Attorney General and Secretary of State before being elected president in 1919. King's True Whig Party had been in power in Liberia since 1877, close to 50 years straight. 1927 was largely seen as an election like any other. King received 240,000 votes, while Falconer got 9,000, an absolute landslide. However, there was something strange about this election. There were only 15,000 eligible voters in this small country, which meant that the country had a voter turnout rate of 1,680%. This election eventually went down in history with the Guinness Book of World Records giving it the title of the most fraudulent election ever reported in history. But to explain how the country got here, we have to go back to its founding in the 1800s. To grossly oversimplify, certain white Americans founded the American Colonization Society ACS, in 1816 to, in their words, deal with the growing number of free blacks in the US by resettling them in Africa. Some abolitionists also believe that free African Americans should return to Africa. But despite this, the vast majority of people, no matter who they were, rejected the idea of moving to Africa. But the few in favor of this were quite influential. After many failed attempts to buy land and subsequent confrontations between native Africans, the settlements started to grow. Liberia officially declared independence from the ACS in 1847 to defend its economic interests. The US formally established diplomatic relations with Liberia in 1862, a country whose constitution was largely based on American laws. They even copied their flag. They aimed to create a democratic republic, but the native peoples on the land were not given the right to vote until 1980. Native Africans were systemically suppressed in Liberia for decades. Keep that in mind for later. In the context of our story, nothing major happened in the country until the end of World War I, when rubber prices were free-falling across the world. This led the UK, which dominated rubber production at the time, to restrict the supply of rubber on the world market. At this time, two-thirds of exported rubber went to the US due to the boom of the automobile industry with the Ford Model T. Harvey S. Firestone, an American rubber manufacturer, was outraged and concluded that America must get its own rubber. He eventually deemed Liberia, with its tropical and humid climate, to be perfect for growing rubber. During negotiations, the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company's demands were controversial, as many Liberians feared that it would effectively turn the country into a colony. But the US government supported Firestone's plans, as it included the building of a major port in Liberia which the US could use. In 1926, Firestone, with US support, got what he wanted. He got 1 million acres of land for 99 years and was exempted from all present and future taxes. He effectively gained unlimited control over 10% of Liberia's arable land. The Liberian government also promised that it would encourage, support, and assist the Firestone Company in maintaining an adequate labor supply. Male Americo Liberians controlled almost all positions of power in the country. They were former slaves, free African Americans, and immigrants coming from the US. Only a few hundred people were employed by the government and the economy was largely limited to the civil service and a few trading companies. However, in 1960, after Firestone came to Liberia, the company employed more than 10,000 people on its rubber plantations. According to official government sources, around 85% of these people were not working for Firestone voluntarily. Under King's first two terms from 1919 to 1927, Liberia's economy became dominated by the rubber industry established on the backs of forced laborers. This now leads us to the infamous 1927 federal election. Thomas J. Falconer, the person running against King, was the former mayor of Monrovia, the nation's capital. He made forced labor a major election issue, and his People's Party seemed to be a credible alternative to voters. King's true Whig Party had ruled the country for close to 50 years now, so they were willing to do anything to keep their hold on power. At the time, only male Americo Liberians had the right to vote, but the government brought tribal chieftains to Monrovia to cast their ballots. These votes were multiplied by the number of people in their tribe, as they were supposedly representing them. This is how King got close to 243,000 votes from only 15,000 eligible voters. Falconer got 9,000 votes. Considering there are just 15,000 registered voters, he understandably felt that he should have won the election, so he tried to get the international community involved. Falconer accused King of allowing slavery, the slave trade, and forced labor to take place in the country, which explicitly banned these practices in its constitution. He also accused government officials, including King and the army, of engaging in the forced shipment of laborers to the island of Fernando Po, a Spanish colony. King tried to silence Falconer, but he managed to get the League of Nations involved, which formed a committee to look into these allegations. 
the League of Nations published the Christie Report in 1930, and this ultimately led to King's resignation. Slavery, as defined by the Anti-Slavery Convention, was concluded to not exist in Liberia, but they determined that the forced shipment of thousands of people to Fernando Po's cacao plantations was associated with slavery. They also found that the government pressured the army to forcibly send these people to plantations thousands of kilometers away from their homes. Firestone and King were both heavily involved in this slavery syndicate. Top government officials were caught getting rich from the suppression and forced labor of native Africans. The House of Representatives started to work towards impeaching President King, but he quickly resigned before they could do anything. Despite this, the recruitment system that supplied Firestone with tens of thousands of forced laborers continued into the 1960s, when the International Labor Organization got involved. Liberian recruitment labor laws weren't changed until 1962. The report also called the election into question, saying that the country, quote, represents the paradox of being a republic of 12,000 citizens with 1 million subjects. Edwin Barclay, who was vice president at the time, replaced King after he resigned in 1930. He ran against Falconer in the 1931 federal election, and the True Whig Party won again. Despite this scandal, among many others, the True Whig Party managed to rule the country from 1878 to 1980, more than a century. It has been suggested that King decided to get 1,680% of votes as a demonstration of his party's incontestable power. To be fair, if it wasn't for the League of Nations getting involved, he probably would have continued ruling the country. With King getting 240,000 votes from only 15,000 eligible voters, the country saw the most rigged election in the history of the world, but its greatest legacy is how it ultimately freed tens of thousands of people from forced labor across Africa. And that's the end of the video. Africa's got so much interesting history, but I feel like it's not talked about enough. So I really hope you guys enjoyed it, and thank you all so much for watching.